Hello and uh, welcome to this professional development webinar brought to you by the Fashion Network. Uh, topic of today, as you'll see, is the world of alternative fabrics, how to utilise sustainable materials. Um, in this panel-based webinar, we will explore the different materials that we have on the market currently, the production of these materials, and we will hopefully look at just how sustainable uh, they really are. Uh, our panel of professionals that we've assembled here today will hopefully be able to share some valuable insights uh, about this, uh, what I would describe as quite a pertinent topic at the moment. Um, however, before we begin, we've got a few things just to note. So if you have any um, questions or any comments, uh, we'd be uh, delighted if you could um, pop them in the chat box. Um, my colleague will ensure that that's switched on for you all to be able to do that. Uh, like I say, we do want to keep this discussion as interactive as possible. So please do get involved if you're out there listening in the audience. We find that this becomes, it becomes a much more, um, uh, a much better learning experience if our audience are involved in chipping in with questions and comments. Um, alternatively, if your comment or question is uh, somewhat uh, difficult to type in the chat box, you can actually use the raise your hand feature and that will allow us to switch your audio feed on and you can speak to us directly. Uh, however, just to warn you that this uh, recording, uh, this is being recorded and will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you do speak to us, your, your voice will be on, on that, just so you know. And speaking of our YouTube channel, if um, we, like I say, we do record these and we do uh, publish them on our YouTube channel. So if you would like to listen to this again, or you'd like to share it with a colleague or a friend or your line manager or whatever, then uh, providing you've signed up to this webinar, you'll get uh, an email around after uh, afterwards thanking you and there'll be a link in that to our YouTube channel. Um, also, immediately after this session, we normally have a little bit of a, a, a debrief and a bit quick networking session. Some of our panelists uh, hopefully will join us. Uh, I know um, I know Mark's got things, so he won't be uh, with us for that. But we have a quick 15 minutes Zoom meeting. You're more than welcome as to quickly join us for that. It's a bit of a sort of networking thing, a uh, virtual networking thing. So before we begin, though, um, if you would like to um, uh, try out the chat box for us, just let us know um, where in the world you are and let us know what it is you do. So pop in the chat box um, where you're from in the world and what it is uh, that you do. That will be really useful for well, both myself and our panelists uh, to know uh, who we're talking to. Uh, my name is Dale and I am uh, one of the co-founders here at Flash Network and I will be chairing today's session. Uh, joining me, uh, we have Amanda Johnson, who's the curator and educational lead at The Sustainable Angle. Uh, alongside Amanda, we have Mark Bloom, who's a founder of Komodo, who uh, Mark has spoke on uh, other webinars that we've done uh, around the topic of sustainability. And Mark's very active in this space and um, uh, has curated um, the sustainable section at a trade show here in the UK called Just Around the Corner. And joining Mark is Mohit Mathur, uh, Chief Sourcing Officer at ACE Turtono. Uh, Mohit's very active in this space, particularly on the supply chain side of things. We've got a quick poll that we're just going to publish now. Um, and it's a simple question, uh, are you, if you are uh, working with a brand, are you currently working with what could be described as alternative fabrics? So get quick yes or no, if you can just uh, uh, respond to that for us. While you're doing that, I'm just going to have a quick look and see who we've got coming in. So we've got um, Debbie, who's uh, coming in from Cornwall, who's a UK fashion circularity consultant. Uh, we've got Sophia, uh, who's French and she's a student. Who else we got here? Uh, Gary Knox from Green Earth Cleaning. Um, welcome, Gary. Monica, uh, Fanfare label based in UK, based in London. Uh, Laura, hi, Laura from uh, South Yorkshire. Uh, we've got people from all over the world by the look of this, which is fantastic. Anyway, here's our poll results. So, um, According to this, 61% uh, of our audience, uh, and that's audience at the moment, 85, say they're not currently working with what they could be described as alternative fabrics. Amanda, I'm going to come to you first. Does that um, surprise you at all? Uh, I don't know. The first thing I was, hello, by the way, um, and thank you so much for inviting me on the panel. It's great to be here. Um, 
a first question would be, um, how are we defining alternative fabrics? I think there's some misunderstanding, um, certainly within the industry and certainly amongst consumers for sure, about what we might mean by that. So I think it would be really good to sort of establish how are we defining alternative fabric? Well, let me fire that question right back at you. <laughs> and who'd like to pick that up? Um, um, well, I know I wouldn't call them alternative fabrics. I would call them the, uh, the only way business can carry on. So, uh, you know, from our perspective, we, we, we use the word alternative when we talk about leather alternatives very often. Um, they're not always fabrics as such. They're not necessarily woven or knitted, although they can be. Um, but we use that word um, certainly, you know, amongst the brands that we use to talk about alternatives to leather. But we don't really use it when we're speaking about other fab uh, fibres and fabrics. We kind of tend to... Uh, you know, see, see materials on a case by case basis. So we kind of say alternative, we'd say we use the word alternative, we use, we use the word um, sustainable, we use the word preferred, textile exchange use the word preferred, meaning as best, you know, the best practice you could get in a, any uh, material category. So, yeah, <laughs> so the, so the, the discussion around that is ongoing, I think. Okay, Mohit, what would you, what terminology do you use uh, when you talk about uh, quote unquote alternative fabrics or, or new fabrics or sustainable well, fabrics? I, I quite agree with Amanda. Um, I don't think that alternative is the right terminology to use. I think in a way we're trying to get sustainable. Yeah, and, um, the whole objective is that how do we contribute? Um, I don't think that there is anything or any fabric that conforms 100% to sustainability because there's something or the other that is required during the manufacturing of either the fiber or the fabric or the processing of it that definitely entails a little bit of you know uh, usage of chemicals or any other thing. So I think it's important for us to understand the way of the future uh, and I think the size uh, that that the sustainability angle is going to contribute uh, to to the production of ranges that retailers are going to be uh, using um, is definitely on the pick. Yeah, I wouldn't say that this is the only uh, alternative available right now. Uh, I think it's it's a path that that a lot of brands are encouragingly picking up. Uh, we're doing that as well, uh, and and I represent the Lee and Wrangler brands in India. So we're heading in that direction. We're, we're doing a lot of actions around sustainability uh, at the fiber level, at a fabric level, at a garment level. Uh, but is it something that we're doing 100%? Um, frankly, there are some commercial considerations, unfortunately, that come in. Uh, but for sure, our path is clear. And I think that's that's the whole objective. You know, that how, do you, how do you make sure that you're heading in that same direction? Uh, and so for me, sustainability is, 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 is a... Uh, definitely right paths that any retailer is choosing for their for their products. So um, what sort of fabrics uh, are you guys currently seeing now coming on the market and that perhaps we didn't see five, ten years ago? Um, Mark, can I bring you on on that? If that's you. What sort of fabrics do you think? Uh, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, we um, we started working last season with uh, corn fabric um and we're following up this summer 23 ahead with uh, banana fabric and uh, definitely <laughs> didn't see many of those around uh very long ago i think you know the appetite clearly and you know and, uh, komodo is you know very much always looking for that kind of thing is you know what what is new out there that we can um you know use as a spearhead in a little way i mean it, it it's you know, I think it's a, it's the job of brands like ours. You know, where we've got the flexibility and we can, and we can, you know, use these things and see how they go and see see what the appetite is. I mean, Lee and Wrangler are obviously much bigger uh, ships to to steer, and you know, you know, you wouldn't expect them to be the ones, you know, trying out something new that's that's barely tested for Komodo. I'll really take anything on if you know if I think it's going to work and come out I don't you know it, it appeals to me more if it's hardly ever been used before so you know that's that's our role in the in the industry I suppose is to uh, find different things you know really my journey I suppose with uh, sustainable fabrics entirely began in the early 90s with um, hemp fabrics um, which at the time were really just sackcloths you know from 
India and Nepal, um, literally sacks that we kind of deconstructed and, and, and cut into trousers. And, you know, we struggled to even sell them at Glastonbury. You know, it was that kind of uh, grungy product. But, you know, that was that was the beginning. Organic cotton didn't really exist. Well, you know, well, it didn't exist. You know, I mean, that came along quite a few years later, sort of mid, late 90s, I guess. I'm not exactly sure of the timing, but, um, you know, hemp sort of was the mother of the, uh, you know, of this of this drive to find something more earthy, more natural, less, you know, less damaging. And then, OK, organic cotton is a good idea. And, uh, you know, then then all of the other fabrics that have followed and been developed through by, you know, lensing and all of the other big, big chemical companies that are going to, you know, put the investment mm -hmm. behind carding and spinning these, you know, difficult fibers into something that we we can use. So um and amanda yeah. can I, I get you to add to that a little bit then? yes absolutely what, what I mean, are the I've, fabrics Sorry, yeah me. sure i mean um we just held our 10th actually anniversary edition of the future fabrics expo in london at the end of june and it was the largest we'd ever put on and i will you know totally agree with the comments you've been saying there is that we're we're at a point in time where we're seeing um, a, a surge in appetite for new innovations and to get to best practice sustainability. Now, as I said, what best practice sustainability varies from fiber category to fiber category, obviously you need to use a different set of criteria in ascertaining what is the best you can get to in any particular um, fiber category. So uh, we have all kinds of kind of complex criteria around how we look at materials and suppliers that, that we work with. Um, but yeah, it's a very exciting uh, moment to be in. You know, we've got about eight years left to address our climate and biodiversity loss issues, which are kind of which are interrelated with uh, social issues as well, um, in order to address climate, climate change and the inherent biodiversity loss as well that's kind of coupled with that. So, and our extractive material uh, practices over the uh, past decades are completely responsible for that. I mean, I think anybody who works in textiles knows that two thirds of global fiber demand is made up of petrochemical materials. And clearly that can't carry on. We can't carry on using it as an energy source or a material source quarter of that demand roundabouts is made up by cotton only one percent of that is farmed organically which is it's on the uptick but it's still moving quite slowly is that right only only one percent of the cotton is is around organic. that of global fiber demand is actually farmed organically this is according to uh, last year's textile exchange preferred um uh, market report so you know wow, it's that's staggering. staggering considering how much of it we really staggering see. exactly so we've put our all our eggs into very toxic fiber uh, fibers petrochemicals and and um you know intensively farmed cotton which is i won't go into how damaging that can be when it's done um, in that intensive way. So, and we've got a very, very small little slice of global fiber demand, which is all of the other fibers that we're all familiar with, whether it's silks and cottons and hemp's and what have you, is tiny, represent a tiny proportion. You're quite right. Hemp is on the upswing. We love hemp at Sustainable Angle. We did a whole education piece on it at the expo. And it's such a, you know, a positive fiber to, to grow agriculturally. It, you know, it gives back to the soil. It's great in rotation. It makes a fantastic carbon sink. You know, it's why is so it why is it so expensive? Uh, well, it's to do it's to do with scalability, right? So all of these new fibers. I mean, you mentioned banana, and we've got an amazing um, innovation, Banana Tex. They're a Swiss brand that actually created their own fabric um, and make their own backpacks out of it, but they sell the fabric. And that's pretty expensive, but it's because they put an enormous amount of effort into creating a very, very unique fibre. And, you know, and it's it's like this, it's this much of the market. And it, uh, my, know, my supplier in China, who's been making really great hemp fabrics in what looks, you know, pretty decent. I mean, you know, not small scale, pretty decent scale. Yeah. I'm doing it for at least 10 years, maybe 15 or 20, you know, like that kind of time frame. And, and yet still the fabric, the material, whether it's Jersey or, you know, whatever, the, you know, it only needs to have 20, 30, 40 percent hemp in it. And it's nearly twice the price of the, the cotton equivalent or, you know, 50, 60 percent more in the fabric. Why? 
it may it, be yeah. with um, uh, spinning technologies they're using. I'm not quite sure because basically we're not working with any um, hemp producers from China, but from France. And obviously it's even more expensive then, mm. but mm. we don't work with Chinese ones, but it, it's a different, um, it might just be due to do with spinning technologies. Um, the, the, the sort of the technical um, limitations of which I'm not that well up on, but it can be quite difficult to uh, blend. The denim industry's really woken up to it. It's become, you know, they're very switched on to, mm. um, and you guys probably know this better than I do, but they're very, very receptive to using, um, you know, different types of cellulose materials that they can put in mixes with cotton. And there's a lot going on with recycling in denim, as you probably all know. Um, mm. In fact, we had an amazing seminar and one of our suppliers, uh, Bossa Denim, that you may, may know, um, he sort of says he's, the industry standard for denim will be recycled cotton. That That is just it. We're kind of, we've reached peak cotton. We don't have enough um, agricultural land to grow it on without overtaking food um, agricultural land because it ha it needs very very specific agricultural land and as you know very specific requirements from um, irrigation um, etc. So and then to grow it organically is very challenging. It's going to take you at least if you're a farmer at least four years to turn over from regular cotton farming to get organic certification it would take you four years and you need financial support to tide you over to do that which is why it's such a challenge I think to kind of go to best practice I mean that's what the messages that we're giving we want to see what's the what where are the positive impacts that we can have with the material with our material needs like with hemp um, because it's great at sequestering and, and giving back new nutrients to the soil or, you know, where can we not damage and where can we try to have these positive impacts from a CO2 and also returning biodiversity, you know, it's great, it's great as a sort of um, biodiversity sort of uh, uh, crop as well, because keeping all the, um, all of the wildlife um, around it. So, you know, it's, uh, we're in an interesting space, but anyway, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Yes, I was going to just sorry to do interject. But, <laughs> but, um, I just wanted to um obviously I'm going to bring Mohit on, on this as well yeah, but I just yeah. want to let you all know if you guys also have a look at the chat box because some interesting yeah, comments yeah. coming in is somebody asking oh, about yes, I'm gonna pineapple be. fabrics um someone says we don't have uh accurate stats around cotton stats and stuff like that so if you guys want to feel to respond to them as well if, if you know by, sure. by writing then you're more than welcome to do that but Rohit can I bring you in on this first point as well like obviously you've heard uh, what Mark and Amanda have both said is there anything I see you nodding quite a bit as well is there anything you want to add to that are, are there any fabrics that you're looking at new fabrics that you're looking at now from a more obviously we have more I think, um, I think it's important that uh, for me the journey is a, is a far bigger uh, you know drive to make uh, we, we are a huge brand and obviously we have certain uh, limitations in terms of what is it that we can introduce um, however, what we are trying to bring in is a bit more of recycled uh, products in terms of recycled fibers. Uh, and I think close to about 7 or 8% of our current product range, it's not a very big number, but currently is driven through recycled uh, fibers, uh, polyester and, and a bit of cotton as well. Um, from a new fabric perspective, I think, uh, I think there are certain limitations from a denim perspective other than recycled, but for sure in our, in our knits and tops categories, we are looking at uh, newer fabrics. So uh, bamboo is one of them, but our, our usage on uh, hemp is, is, is again, um, there are some prohibitive costs as Amanda and Mark pointed out, and that's largely driven because it's, it's a very short length fiber and therefore spinning it is, is a considerable cost. And unfortunately we get the scale on it. And I guess the scale has to come from uh, literally a mind shift in the consumer's mind. Till the time the consumers don't shift uh, and for me it's not sustainable or alternative fabric it's an alternative mindset of the consumers that has to be brought on with greater speed once consumers start adopting and, and there is definitely traction being built up on the increase of that uh, but but we at our end are definitely making sure that we're reaching out to our consumers uh, more effectively uh, to ensure that they start understanding the contributions that uh, we are making in, in making let's say uh, earth a better place to live in um, but we are definitely exploring newer options uh, I think um, 
bamboo and and then definitely uh, recycle is, is are the big ones for us uh, in, in, the, in the upcoming ranges well there's an interesting uh, question coming here from emma my brand uses got certified organic cotton i'm very interested in using recycled denim yarn to knit my socks with but uh, the <laughs> I, was about, I was about Go to on. type in. I was about to type in the answer. Hello, Emma. Well, um, shall, I, shall I just read it out so everyone else could read the yes, last bit? So, sure, sure. So, um, I have felt so far that uh, not achieving the same softness as organic cotton. Can you recommend uh, a recycled denim spun yarn to knit with that is uber soft and does not scratch the skin, as the softness is really important to our product? I have to. Hand my hand, yes. hold my hand up and say yeah, yes. I, I was agree just about to type into you, Emma, just as everybody else was talking. So, um, yeah, I'm basically we were just speaking before about uh, lensing fibers, tensile. Yeah. So they're really famous for best practice uh, regenerated cellulosic, um, which is essentially wood feedstock. Um, fibers, very high quality, and using closed loop system, which in this fiber category is really important. Everybody knows about. Viscose type material is very soft and drapey and smooth feeling. So um, they actually uh, created an innovation. I think it was launched in about 2017 or 18 and it was called Refibra. So if you just go Googling lensing Refibra, you will see that it's the tensile closed loop process, but this 30% of Refibra contains um, either pre or post consumer um, cotton in with the wood feedstock mix. So what you end up is you've got, you're closing the loop with all of that factory waste or whether it's post-consumer um, jeans waste or whatever. And it's it's actually joining this new fiber. So you're getting a super silky, soft, beautiful fiber with the added benefit of having some recovered cotton in there, but that nice softness that you're used to with a tensile fiber. So check you it out. You ask for a spelling as well. If you could pop that in the chat box as well. Uh, Amanda, that'd be great. Yes, Mark. Mark, mm -hmm. you got anything to add to that? Or shall I move on to my next question? Um, no, that's all good. I mean, uh, yeah. Cool. Let's move on. Uh, so my next question, obviously, that we've got that we've obviously through our discussion points is about uh, we did a sustainable. We did a, a, a. I think it was the last one you were on, um, Mark, but. We talked a little bit about uh, natural and uh, ve vegan fabrics. Uh, I do believe uh, vegan fab fabrics has got a little bit of hit recently. Do you want to talk to us about sort of the, the so-called pluses and minuses of using vegan fabrics? I, I do believe it's not all roses, if that makes sense. What? Vegan fabrics? Uh, vegan fabrics, yeah. We got a, little, got a lot of heat last time we, we were running a, a session uh, like this, uh, saying it's not all, they're not always the best or sustainable fabrics to use within uh be it apparel or footwear um amanda you're nodding a little bit there if you want to pick mm -hmm. that you as opposed to woolen as opposed to woolen yes 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 leather yeah because some of them are polymits and stuff like that do you want to do you want to pick that up amanda if you... yeah i mean it's i mean it's obviously it's such an emotional issue isn't it we have so we're feeling so many people going towards vegan lifestyles, you know, for, for worries around, you know, animal ethics, but also around climate change. We've seen, you know, Caspiracy and all these movies coming out. So you've got this, you know, this burgeoning sort of vegan lifestyle uh, consumer base um, who really want to do the right thing and want to put their money where their mouth is. And I totally get with that. However, very often choices are made by consumers just based on one siloed issues, which is, I don't want to kill animals. Well, fine that's your choice and therefore we should you know as an industry be responding to that but very often as as you pointed out Dale you know it can mean that basically the choice is a petrochemical uh, based uh, material so most of the vegan leather uh, substitutes or alternatives as we call them are quite heavy in petrochemical coating they're usually some sort of a base cloth and that's usually synthetic whether it's a woven or a knit and then they coat it with a very, I mean, you smell it, you know, you smell the product, it smells like petrol. And so, um, and also it doesn't, it doesn't wear well, it peels off, the backing peels off it. So, you know, you've also got a product that doesn't have a long life and then goes into waste far more quickly than many others would. So that's the sort of uh, situation normal with vegan, the vegan leather market at the moment. However, we're very, very excited by the, the huge drive towards trying to solve these material requirements in ways which are much more 
intelligent for the biosphere. So whether that be, uh, there's been a huge rush and a massive amount of investment in uh, mycelium based leathers. So for example, we're seeing a covative have one very beautiful one and it doesn't have any PU in it whatsoever. Um, and it's grown from the root structure of mushrooms. Obviously they're drying it, they're compacting it, they're sort of tanning it, but it's not containing harmful substances. Those are all, there's a lot of them out at the moment with various different brand names that are about to become scalable. Adidas just released a shoe last year uh, as well. There's Milo, there is one called Reshi trademarked, you know, so we're going to see a whole slew of mycelium based alternative leathers coming out without the petro, uh, petroleum. But the one that we're the most excited about is um, Miram. So the trademark name is Miram. Um, and it's been created by a company called Natural Fiber Welding, and they actually is completely 100% biosource, absolutely no petrochemicals in it whatsoever. And what's really interesting about it is they can actually take old Miram. So if you have a bag made from Miram, you take the buckles and the zip off it. They can grind it back up if it's you know <laughs> if it's been kicked out of shape, or whether they can grind it back up and make a new material out of it, exactly the same. It can be continually put back into a recycling system. So it is, according to them, forever more recyclable. So we're really excited about the bio-based leather alternatives because we think they represent far less impact and some of them with more positive impacts um, than obviously the petrochemical. We need to stay away from the petrochemical one. But what you will find is there's been a lot of chat about um, lots of bio-based um, alternative leathers that still have a little um, a PU coating on them, like a small percentage. So that percentage might account for 15% of the material makeup. Um, somebody in the chat also was asking about pineapple waste. I can't remember where I saw it. I was also going to answer to that, pineapple waste. So I think we've all heard of Pinatex, which is the non-woven, created from byproduct of the pineapple harvest. It's a beautiful material, really, really nice. It's not going to fully substitute a leather, but it's got its own characteristics. It's gorgeous, but it still has a little PU within the coating. They're working really hard to get that down as far as they can, and they want to get it to a bio-based coating. But of course, to deliver these material innovations, there are expectations by the consumer that it will have a certain hand feel and it will do certain things. So that's why, because we're so locked into petrochemical materials, we're still defaulting to them. So it takes quite a lot of work and experimentation and testing to get ourselves out of uh, using these petrochemical materials in all different product categories. Sorry, did that go on a bit too long? <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. So um, Mark, do you, do, you, do, you, do you produce anything that is, is vegan uh, orientated or, or how do you pitch? So you say that again? Do I think so what? If you have anything in your collection, your range, which you, you sell as vegan uh, friendly? Yeah, we do. We do because we have, we have a few customers in Germany, particularly where the whole, the, you know, they won't buy anything that's not vegan. So we do make uh, knitwear in the winter, uh, you know, from wool um, and they won't buy it. <laughs> um, so, so then we look, okay, right. We need to, you know, so what can we offer them? So we'll, so because of that demand from a, you know, a reasonably significant customer for us, we'll do more in cotton, organic cotton in the winter and look for other fibers that can work, you know, it, you know, as from a brand point of view, you, you know, you've, you've, you discover something interesting. I mean, um, you know, just talking about Pinatex, the, uh, the pineapple Pinatex fabric, so, you know, I saw Pinatex, well, I don't know, when it was new, eight, nine years ago, whatever it was, and thought, oh, great, you know, let's, you know, and just because the fabric was so exciting and the innovation you felt like was like, wow, good on them, you know, I mean, they've, brilliant, they've made leather-like fabric out of pineapple, so I really tried to get some to use it and, and you know, what can we make it into, Um and it's very expensive. It was very difficult to get at the time. It might be, I think it's probably a bit easier now, but you know, it, you know, it was, it, the, the, the uphill was too steep. I couldn't, I couldn't get hold of it. I couldn't get products out at anywhere near our price point that, you know, would have worked with my customers, but you know, those innovations from the fabric suppliers do, you know, when they filter, once we become aware of them. So, I mean, I've just made a note of that Miram because I've never heard of it and you know, in, in those days, I made I made more shoes and and bags, and you know, we were sort of in that 
pigeonhole a little bit and I had the opportunity to do it. I remember, well, I don't know how, 25 years ago or more going on a pilgrimage to Adelaide to find fish leather because somebody had come up with fish leather and we wanted to make, you know, I don't, I don't eat cows and I'm you know, totally against uh, cow leather really. You know, I, I say I wouldn't use it in our production. Um, and oh, fish leather that, you know, that works. And we heard about these barramundi fish or something that were getting turfed out of the river because they were pests and they were being mashed up into pet food or something because they were just damaging the ecosystem in Australia. And, and there was some eccentric cranky guy in Adelaide that had figured out how to skin them and turn the, you know, and it's like, Oh, just enough to make a one side of a pair of shoes. Great. And I went there and found him and, you know, very fun, but, but um, yeah, we, our brand didn't really, isn't really strong enough to, you know, it didn't really work very commercially. You know, yeah. we did it a couple of seasons and it was, it was a fun thing to do, but um, you know, brands, you know, have to, you know, so they get the initiative or they, they discover the initiative from the fabric makers. And I think possibly that line of communication could be stronger. I mean, like, you know, we, you know, the, 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 the guys that are developing these fabrics, they're not going to sell them to the Lee and Wrangler to start with, or the big chains. You know what I mean? They're going to need small fashion designers to pick up and run with it. And those small fashion designers need to be able to get their products out at a sensible price. And I, I don't know who finances these things, but you know, if they're making an interesting fabric out of mushrooms and it's in its infancy and it's in its development stage, and you know, you might get a bigger chain of stores or a bigger brand looking to see, okay, well. How does this work out? Let's, you know, if I was, you know, maybe in their shoes, I'd be thinking, well, what little brands or small to medium sized brands have used it? How are they doing with it? Is it performing? Is it all getting returned? Is it falling apart? Is it, you know, is it commercially, does it have a biting point? And I think the industry could join up a lot better by, you know, doing, you know, using each of us for our strengths and kind of connecting yeah. us a little bit. Well, can I bring Mohit on, on, in on this then? So, uh, Mohit, obviously you talked earlier about the fabrics you were interested in, but, you know, listening to both Amanda and Mark, are there any sort of, any sort of these fabrics that are on the peripheries of being commercial that you're not currently using at the moment, but you're quite excited to see what will happen with them? So vegan is not something that is anywhere on, on our, uh, let's say, sourcing board right now. Uh, but the other fibers, so definitely likes of hemp, uh, jute, linen, modal, uh, connecting with some of the lensing fibers, lyocell, these, these are all part of, of you know, some of the many ranges that we do produce. But I think as Mark's got it right, uh, I think it's, it's very difficult for brands at our size to deploy big ranges, uh, knowing that there is definitely, uh, you know, uh, some commercial challenges in, in, in making it really big. Um, I've seen some of the comments coming in from, 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 from the folks uh, who, are, who are listening to us, asking how is it that, you know, smaller people can, can reach out to some of these manufacturers, but You'll be surprised, people, that um, uh, some of these uh, guys who are doing some some changes in the in, in in the sustainability world are very very open, are very very receptive to working with smaller brands um, because they know that the traction will be built by by you know picking up smaller bits. Uh, it's not something that's going to turn overnight. Uh, so you should have the courage to speak out and reach out to some of these, you know, um, yarn supplies. So lending, I know for sure, does support a smaller quantities as well. You need to then make sure that those fibers are getting connected with the right spinning mills to get your fabrics in place. But the world is moving in that direction. Um, we 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 are we are we are taking our steps as well. And, and while we may not be as brave to bring in a whole new fiber of fabric on board, uh, but we definitely have ranges that are made from sustainable, especially recycle is a big part for us. And as, mentioned, as I mentioned earlier as well, we don't believe that there is anything that is called 100% sustainable. Everything leaves a footprint. How is it that we are making changes in our ranges, in our fabric sourcing, um, and especially being a denim brand, uh, we have a lot of focus on, on the processing of our product as well. Yeah. So, we make sure that a, the, the, the factories that we work with are, are absolutely the right factories and, and, and they don't 
uh, you know, uh, give back into the environment, uh, all the waste. Uh, we do make sure that, you know, end pieces of our fabrics are converted into something like shopping bags. Uh, we do make sure that we go in for laser uh, processing on, on our denim jeans instead of, you know, the sand, the stones, you say, et cetera, et cetera. So every bit out there, um, I'm sure that, you know, um, we will we'll take some steps in, in the coming near future that will help us move, uh, I won't say tectonic shifts, but definitely step, steps that will help us make, make sure that we're contributing far more actively um, to what, what's, what, what the consumers need to be adapting to. Brilliant. So we've sort of we've talked a little bit about, you know, the current vegan fabrics not always being always good. Uh, I want to ask about animal derived fabrics not always being bad, if you like. I'm so, I know I'm overly simplifying this, but I want to sort of, I mean, one of the things we spoke about uh, in a previous session as well is wool. I mean, wool sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, does anybody want to talk about wool? Because I mean, I've, I did a tour a few years ago with the British Wool Marketing Board, and you know, obviously it's it's, it's being replenished all the time, isn't it? Um, so Amanda, yeah. do you want to pick up on? Absolutely. I think, you know, we also, as an organisation, love wool. And it's a tragedy here, particularly in the UK, how, you know, farmers, I mean, literally, they can't get money from shearing. Well, they can't afford to pay the shearing costs because nobody will pay the money for the for the wool. And there's there are big moves, there are pro projects to try and change that. And we work with an innovator who was getting funding to try and switch that perception really about about wool and it's been done a great disservice as well by uh, being rated extremely poorly on the Higg index and there's been a lot of controversy about that for those of you in the know that may be brands that use the Higg index um, it depends on how what how you look at the data and how you skew the data as to whether you determine something is sustainable or not but I, I think with wool as you quite rightly point out, there is definitely a case where it's an incredible fiber, incredibly useful fiber. And it's extraordinary when you look at it under a microscope and what it can actually do with water repellency. It's both hydrophobic and hydrophilic at the same time. It's, it's quite extraordinary. And we're just treating this like rubbish and it's not, it's a valuable resource. So for example, we work with a company called HD Wool who are trying, you know, they're up north, they're trying to sort of reinvigorate uh, British wool, because I think it's very much, if you are going to ascertain whether a material is sustainable or not, you've got to look about, look at the, where in the world, okay? You've got to use a different set of metrics when you're trying to ascertain whether it's a UK wool, whether it's a Australian wool or whatever. So I think we need to look at things on a case by case basis. Um, as a fiber, it is great. We would support that being um, reinvigorated in this country for sure, because it's not compromising other agri agricultural land where sheep are grazing, for example. Um, same thing goes with leather, as you said. We have a big project on with the Savory Institute um, at the moment around regenerative agriculture. So we, um, as an organization, we support the push to getting fibers from regenerative agricultural systems. Because when we talk about uh, actually needing to uh, restore and repair agricultural systems which have been um, you know done in a in a sort of typical way using pesticides and fertilizers they can be extraordinarily powerful as carbon sinks they can be extraordinarily powerful supporting biodiversity the return of biodiversity so if you have a regenerative organic farm and you uh, are using the livestock to regenerate that agricultural land and the, the meat is a byproduct from that system, you're looking at best case leather scenario, providing all the protocols are in place for animal welfare. You could say that that would be as, as you know, as a study case, if you were getting leather from a situation like that, that's a whole other situation than sourcing your skill your skins from brazil that is part of an intensive agricultural system that has chopped down acres and acres of ancient and endangered forests to support that cattle that is a whole different sustainability scenario than the one i just spoke about so then we as an organization we don't demonize leather but we're very specific about supporting leather from regenerative agricultural situations 
I know can it's more expensive, yeah. but it's also worth it. <laughs> can you can you imagine a, or is there any initiatives to um, identify like through like a kind of got like you know like, like the organic cotton or you know certify yeah there, leathers there from, through a good source that people that do want to work with leather can do so in confidence with a sort of greener you know yes. uh, you know I think also for the I mean I'm sure the consumers absolutely if you're buying a leather you know product it's probably you know a bag or a jacket or you know quite a big piece you know you you know hopefully more and more people want to know those I things think, and... I think I think they will and there's been some amazing projects done now okay they're very small scale but they prove that it can be done mm. it's is from this sourcing um Anya Hindmarch now okay she's a luxury luxury yeah product but but she actually produces a, a regenerative agricultural bag range all made in the UK so it's, it's proving it can be done mm -hmm. and you can say okay this is very tiny scale it's super super luxury but if the consumer realizes the value of it and they're going yeah. well that's if I'm going to invest in leather I want to know where it's come from and I want to invest and, I, and it's my forever piece I'm going to keep for 40 years and I'm going to hang, hand it down to my kids kind of thing then under those which is how people used to buy products not that long ago let's face it you know we used to mm. find crafted beautiful things worth investing in and we would expect them to deliver on performance etc it's only with the advent of fast fashion we've lost that relationship with fashion so uh, yeah, there's a, there's quite a few, but in in answer to your your question, um, Mark, there is a regenerative organic um, standard. This they're a little bit further ahead um, in agriculture in the states. So for example, the Savory Institute, uh, they've got a whole sort of program about encouraging farmers to switch over to regenerative because this is the way we're going to use this type of farming to sequester carbon and increase biodiversity and help the, the nutrients of the soil so we can get better growth, whether that be for food or, or fiber. And so there's a big drive at the moment to recognize that we are so dependent on nature. Well, we're part of nature. We don't see ourselves as that, but we are. We're a species too. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and if we don't do things the right way, if we don't fix the damage we've done, we will, won't survive. It's really that simple. If you read any science on this, not that I'm a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but it's very persuasive. And so I think the consumer's waking up to this more and more. So when it comes to a leather product, if you do want to buy leather, then let's kind of, you know, encourage the consumers to understand it and go, yeah, it's worth me investing in that. I, I like that story. That's, what, that's where I want to put my money. Um, so yeah, we've, um, we've, for anybody that's interested, actually, we have a whole uh, seminar series that came with our expo in January that's up on YouTube. And there's a really amazing um, seminar about regenerative agriculture on there. I will put the link in the you chat. You can share that for you as well, if you want, Amanda, yeah. in our follow around yeah. email. There's somebody agree agreeing with you, as Christian's saying, leather does need regenerative solutions. Some tanneries are leading the way as a tannery in Turkey apparently that's leading the source from a sustainable perspective yeah. maybe um never is my bag excuse me so. <laughs> you guys well, chucked in there christine yeah. <laughs> absolutely um, so we're in the last quarter of the session now so i just want to ask i want to move on a little bit to sort of like a bit of a professional development question i'm kind of looking at mark or mohit on this one but what so we do lots of the fashion network our sort of focus is putting together professional development and thought leadership development content so with you know whether it's to do with design or e-commerce or product development as this is what can designers do to sort of like try and upskill and keep ahead of the game i'm not sure who i'm sort of looking at mark or mohit on that one um mark you look well i think you know designers as i said you know really just keeping our ears to the ground and trying to find new you know developments and um you know i'm always telling my factories and and fabric suppliers you know we look you know next season's coming next year's coming what's new what's what's in the pipeline what what can you propose to us that's um you know that's going to push the boundaries a little bit more and and that's you know how we've really operated for years and years and years and um 
yeah you know i think that's that's what we can contribute really is is trying these new things out giving them a bit of airplay really um you know we've you know for the the chain is you know we're very aware of our place in the chain really that we're you know passing these fabrics on or you know to print to dyeing them printing them developing them to you know present in a fashion context to the you know nice independent you know boutiques that we supply all across europe mostly um and you know get the feedback from the public and we get the feedback you know from our shop owners you know when they come and see us you know each season and tell us what's been going on and you know we get a really nice feedback from from through them of the, what the customers and the shops have been saying and you know i think you know they you know you know if, i think when we're brave enough to do it and we you know we know looking at the thing whether it's likely to work and you know whether it'll, you know what sort of demand it'll attract and you know it's that it's that balance between interest feeling the look of it the price of it you know and and how it's going to fit into a collection of uh, uh you know a stylish collection for the next season but you know i've got a you know pretty good idea from looking at the base fabric whether i think this is going to pan out and work and work well but we're always open to something new and interesting and you know we're limited by well. our own abilities and, you know how much of it can we can we develop we you know the minimum order of, but you know if, it, if if you need a thousand meters of a color to do it okay i'm gonna have to take a deep breath and you know you know stick to maybe one color or two colors you know i mean there's you know we've only got so much strength within the, the context of the rest of the collection as to what i realistically think i can do so there is a pressure on us to you know be able to do it but you know i think if the industry can support smaller designers doing that kind of thing then then it, it pushes the whole thing along and that's that's our that's our role in the in the game mohit can i obviously you you deal with a slightly different uh side of the industry to mark obviously what's your what's your tips in terms of sort of the designers perhaps that you work with what can they do to sort of stay ahead of the game and you know stay up to date within this topic? i think i think uh, the designers definitely need to be uh, Bit bit more acclimatized to the fact that uh, at some point they'll have to offset a little bit of their creative minds versus the reality of what is available from a sustainable front. Yeah. So uh, I often hear designers coming in saying, "Oh, um, you know, we we're not getting the right colors, we're not getting the right hand feel, uh, we're not getting the softness level that we want to." So we've got to understand that uh, there is there is some sort of a uh, you know, uh, offset that we have to do versus, uh, let's say, the 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 the, the uh, normal fabric that are available in the market. So there will there will there's something that they have to keep in their mind to say, okay, I'm gonna be uh, uh, giving up a little bit on my color dreams and make sure that, that that what is available in the market, whether it is through vegan dyes or vegetable dyes, however it is, that's where we operate on. In terms of being in touch with the industry. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm based out of India, uh, and I'm 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 a part of several uh, you know groups of of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs both at a design level, small brands, manufacturers, even some spinning mills, yarn manufacturers, and and I, I can assure you that there are a lot of people who are thinking the way we are thinking right now on this panel, yeah, and they are all aware that everything is not scalable. So there's a lot of accessibility, there's a lot of support coming in. The scale of it is not to what we are expecting it to be, but uh, designers just need to reach out to the right forums, uh, make sure that they're, 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 they're available and understanding the process first. Yeah. Just making demands out of what is being expected instead of understanding how the whole process of a sustainable fabric or a fiber is going to be created, uh, there needs to be a match out there. And I think that's 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 probably another thing that you know everybody needs to look into. I think those are two things that I just want to address for the design community. We've got to be realistic on what is it that we are expecting, and and making sure that um, we 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 are we are in line with those expectations. 
and obviously I like like fashion networks webinar series because we deliver a lot of professional development content on this topic and and we're, this is an event we've uh, put together and sponsored ourselves but we're always keen to hear uh, from our audience topics that uh, you think we should cover so please let us know either if you let us know in the chat box or you can email us or however you want to connect with us uh, we ourselves will respond to the demand what people want to learn really um, my next question before we get into the final uh, final last mile then is um, how can brands, designers and find, um, I might come to you on this first, Amanda, uh, how can uh, brands and designers find suppliers to, to you know, that, that, that are very active in this space? <laughs> um, yes, come to the Future Fabrics Expo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And when we are, when we don't have a physical, because I know somebody in the chat earlier had, had said that they'd visited, Obviously, we do our large scale expo uh, once a year. It will be held again in London uh, at the end of June, um, 23. Uh, until then, we uh, we have our virtual expo. So if you go on to our website, in fact, I did put it in the chat earlier, um, we have what we call a virtual expo. So you can see quite a lot for free. And then after that, there's a sort of, there's a small subscription to pay. Somebody else was also asking, um, you know, a small design label about smaller quantities. We also have some, um, a small um, uh, minimum order quantity section as well. So you can find a huge range of materials on there. It's great for desk-based sourcing. Um, and every now and again, we will pop up somewhere else. So just sign up on our website, the sustainableangle.org. And we'll send you a newsletter and let you know what we're doing. If we're going to do anything, any pop-ups in the meantime, obviously we'll post that on news. Yes, I'll put the I'll put the link on now. Mm. Um, and there's also there are lots of other. I mean, we're not we're not the only ones as well. I think um, Common Objective is quite a, a useful yeah. site as yeah, well. Yeah. I think you probably all know about that. Um, so you know, go to them, come to us because you can use our databases on on, mm. on both sites. Yeah, Mark. Mm. Can I get you on that? I don't. I don't expect you to uh, divulge your entire supply chain, but it's you know any tips on where people can go to find <laughs> suppliers active in this space. Um, again, I'd I'd endorse Common Objective definitely. Um, I'm not so familiar with Amanda's uh, organisation, so I've just little made a little note now. I'm going to check it out afterwards. Um, yeah, I mean. It, 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 what is it you know small designers you know can mean virtually anything so it really depends you know it's got to be like you know you accessible to you and you know you've always got to, i always tell young designers you know you've got to keep your eye on the price at the end and make something that you can sell because you know you know the first my first rule about talking about sustainability is you've got to be sustainable yourself so if you're running a small business and you're trying to get a, a label going you know you've got to be sustainable yourself and and you know that means paying your bills and that means you know being able to sell the stuff and and make a profit for yourself that sustains you and takes you forward so you know you you really you know i think i'm you know it you have it's a compromise i mean you know as is life but i mean you know you have to use the most sustainable fabrics you can that fit your price point that fit your quantity situation that fit your transport situation and then improve on it you know Komodo didn't start as the you know you know you know we started because we kind of happened to make patchwork things that today you would call up cycles so in those days they just called it patchwork and bit <laughs> hippie and you know you know we've, we've developed a nice language to, and you know and, and it's developing further and further as we drill into the detail of how each of these fabrics are comprised but you know if you're trying to get going and started find your nearest local affordable best case scenario that you can make something and you you know you'd be proud of that because that's the mm -hmm. best you can do right now have a good season have a good year you know double your customers for next year have your customers doubling their budgets with you for next year or you know increasing them anyway and you can go further and you can do more and you can you know you can take on more interesting fabrics or more green eco for you know but don't bite off more than you can chew to start with you you know you must sustain yourself and step by step because you know 
whether you're looking at Komodo or your people tree or, 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 you know, lots of brands that, you know, you know, we, you know, we do claim to, you know, proud of what we're doing and, you know, but, you know, hopefully in a, in a year or two's time, we will be doing much better. And, you know, five years later, we'll still be here doing better still, you know, it's a work in progress. And um, that's, you know, you get on where you can get on and you keep going. It's, it's, pro, it's, it's, it's not a finite thing. Brilliant. There's a, um, someone's, oh, sorry, that's you, Amanda, just putting the plug in for the New York based thing. But I'm going to come to you, Mo, at the end then. So obviously our audience aren't all just small brands and designers. Yeah. We've got obviously people from a, a, a wide array of businesses, but from a, a larger retail business, where would you sort of recommend they go? Uh, well, I think whatever, whatever level you're in, you're, yeah. you know, you you know, can you do better? That's, that's the, you know, of course yeah. the answer is yes, we can. It takes time. You've got to plan. You, you, you can't, throw out i mean I, I think there's an issue that i've struggled with and i you know i think in our department store space and across the land and maybe you know for the bigger brands you, you can say something as well but you know they're a little reserved about doing anything green and organic and flying the flag because if they put five percent of their products in as organic then the question arises well how do you defend the other 95 percent of it and that culture of oh you know we don't want to be seen to be dipping our toe in because it might not reflect well on the rest of it that that has to change and that's a public perception and you know i think companies are honestly trying to improve their uh, sustainability throughout their process then they should be you know, able to talk about it and be appreciated for what they are doing without being slaughtered for, you know, trying to steer a huge container ship around 180 degrees in in the space of one season or one year. Everybody's got to do what they can do. And um, maybe there's a role there in the in the media and, and so forth to sort of, you know, applaud efforts that are genuine and going in the right direction and not just to slate brands because you know they're not they're not as good as another brand you know it's yep. we're all on a journey in a you know in our own at our own pace and uh when you're yeah. getting people agreeing with you in the chat box which is good <laughs> it's always a plus um Mohit, you can have the last word so where would you where would you suggest big or small um people grow to find suppliers uh active in this space well as i said uh, whether you're whether you're smaller in size or you, or you're a huge conglomerate, uh, it's the thought process that is that is driving your uh, business. Yeah. If, if you're heading in the right direction, you will find the right people to connect with you. Mm-hmm. And and there are suppliers uh, for every stage of you know the apparel production cycle that are available to help support you in your journey. So we obviously have a connect with some of the largest people in the world for producing, you know, top end fabrics and yarns. And they also have a sustainability angle towards it. Yeah. So they, they, they contribute actively in several ways in making sure that they are heading in that direction. And then I mean, Mark is absolutely right out there. You gotta have a commercial angle around you. If, you're, if, you, if you are trying to change the world overnight, uh, it's not going to happen. It, it's a, it, it, there are steps to be taken, uh, and if you're heading in the right direction, you will make a transformation. Um, but every brand has to become sustainable by themselves as well. You've got to see a little bit of commercial angle as well when you're producing your ranges. And then the moment you start seeing traction being built up, then you move to the next level. You scale it up, and that's that's how almost every big brand is moving as well. Uh, you can go onto the websites of any of these, uh, any, any of the big brands, and you will see a huge section on how is it that we are contributing in making you know the world a better place. How is it that we're making effective manufacturing practices? So um, it's it's a change being done, uh, and it will take place for sure. And then as long as we've got the right people, the right mindset. Uh, and that that exists, I firmly believe that there is a there's a strong momentum being built up across the globe of heading in this direction. And I'm sure we'll see see those changes coming in as well. Thank you very much. Well, we are our time is up basically. We've done we started a little bit late, so we finished a little bit late. So huge thank you to all of you, Amanda, Mark, and Mohit. 
Um, as mentioned, we do have a little bit of a debrief after this. If, if you see, there's the link to join us afterwards. Um, it'd be great if you guys could join us, Mark, um, Mohit, yes. Amanda. Mark, I believe you've got a meeting, so if yeah, you can, no problem. But we just have a quick. I can for just about ten minutes, and that's, then I've got to skip to another. That's yeah. absolutely fine. That's all we last yeah. for ten minutes. Just a quick feedback, quick debrief, and exchange emails with anyone that wants to connect absolutely. with you. Absolutely. So. So our audience, if you guys want to join us for 10 minutes, is a chance just to exchange emails and, and you know, give us a bit of feedback. Uh, we shall see you in a separate room. So the link is there in the chat box. Huge thank you to all of you guys for speaking and hope to connect with you all again soon. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye -bye.